Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session of the Linux Confu 2017. Um, this uh, presentation is by George Fong, who uh, is a familiar face around here, and he will be discussing open source's role in defending the security and integrity of the net. Please make him welcome. Let's make sure I unmute myself first. I don't know how many um, um, board meetings I've done over Zoom, and I'm talking away and yelling at people, and they're all going. Uh, it's quite difficult. Um, for those of you who uh, um, are expecting a highly technical um, talk today, please forgive me. I will apologize now. This is more of the high level and policy um, uh, level than talking about some of the technical stuff. Although at the end, I would like to uh, talk just about some of the initiatives that have taken place. But what I'm interested in at the moment is the fact that there is a, a significant amount of uh, information about how prolific we are within the world of the internet and open source plays a significant part of that. There's very little understanding in the public about why that is and how that um, assists. Now, from the perspective of the net, um, my role on Internet Australia this last 18 months has been to bring the organisation to the fore and to the general public. It has been a long, traumatic, difficult and sometimes unpleasant ride. And the reason we have done that is to gain relevance. What I'd like to talk about today is some of the relevance of what we do and how the open source community affects the general population and why it is important to engage in the sorts of things that are being done to ensure that we live in a safer world, in a world that is quite clearly becoming um, uh, more and more conscious of the fact um, that we live in the digital economy and in a digital, digital environment and community. Um, this time last year, I was castigated for making a somewhat uh, a um, um, uh, naive comment about um, young Chelsea Manning. Um, I find it both um, satisfying and um, um, uh, uh, um, somewhat frightening that on the one hand, Chelsea Manning has now been um, pardoned um, and her, 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 um, uh, um, her um, sentence commuted, but on the other hand, I think it's about now or is it this morning that Donald Trump goes through his inauguration? Um, so it's a, an interesting time for the people who have a policy focus on what will happen next uh, in terms of where we stand. And um, I suppose it's uh, um, uh, useful to point out the fact that that graphic up there um, um, is from, does anybody recognize the film? Um, there's a sequel coming out this year apparently from Blade Runner. Um, and they're making a, 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 a remake, well, a second part of Blade Runner this year. So it's been a, a quite significant uh, uh, start to the year. And as far as Internet Australia and open source is concerned, this is the year of security, privacy, and integrity. The, um, these three concepts are now at, not eight, um, at the forefront of the issues facing the internet and technical communities in 2017. You'll be aware of the fact that this is in spite of and not because of government dictates. Um, we at Internet Australia, as we pointed out last year, have been um, prosecuting some fairly um, uh, strident debates with the government about things like site blocking, about things like data retention, and the enormous technical task that we are now faced with, which must be in place by April 2017. And for the potential risk um, to the people that we actually serve as and, 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 and treat as our stakeholders, i.e. the general community, uh, in that respect of, uh, of what we do as technical, a technical community. And in LCA 2016, I gave a speech where the title was that the cavalry is not coming, we are the cavalry, act accordingly. And that hasn't changed. In fact, if anything, that has become uh, sharper in focus, and it is more the case that the community, the technical community, the internet community, um, that serves all of these stakeholders, which are the entire population of the planet, um, have on their shoulders a requirement and a responsibility that they did not ask for. I think it was yesterday or the day before Dan Callahan said this, open access to the internet is a fundamental tenet of the global internet. Uh, sorry, what he did say was that, 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 that he quoted the Mozilla Manifesto number two. Um, and as you can see on the screen, it says there that the internet is a global public resource that must remain open and accessible. Open access and, uh, to the internet is a fundamental tenet of the global internet society and of us. And so he's right. And the question is open and accessible to whom? 
Uh, the answer is everybody, and on what basis? On a basis that it is secure, private, integral, and trusted. And again, recap, the Internet Architecture Board Statement of Confidentiality, which I won't read out to you, uh, makes it very clearly uh, clear that uh, the technical community at that level took veiled outrage at the fact that you know, it was institutional um, that people were allowed, or that agents of, of governments were allowed to get into uh, systems without telling the public about what was going on. And as it says there, the IAB believes now that the only way forward is to ensure that we move to a philosophy, whether it's achievable or it is another matter, to a philosophy of encrypt everything. And again, IAB, trust is fundamental. So this word trust, reliability and integrity keep coming up all of the time. And that's something that uh, at Internet Australia level we have become used to and the arguments that we take to government uh, and the arguments we must justify to government are surround those issues. That's a very difficult thing for government to do when they are supposedly fighting a, uh, a, a battle against terrorism, against crime, against other things, and the balance needs to be struck. And in the fight to try and find that trust and integrity, uh, we conceded to the fact that the data retention um, uh, laws had bipartisan support. And what we then did was work with the Attorney General's Department to see if we could sort the mess out. We said to them that the, the, data, the, the, the legislation was fundamentally flawed, and Philip Ruddick said to me, well, that being the case, can't we fix it with regulations? And I said, well, it's fundamentally flawed, so will the regulations. And from a legal perspective, that is the level of argument we needed to take. It was no point trying to explain to a parliamentary joint committee on, in, uh, on, on, um, um, uh, on intelligence and security about the technical aspects of why we think the data retention stuff was going wrong fundamental things like we need to encrypt all the data that we collect that's pretty cool what standards need to be um, applied to that encryption oh it just needs to be encrypted um, what sort of data needs to be collected oh we've given a plain english version of what data needs to be collected you work it out and in the uh, documentation one of the things that happened was that it said that all data must be encrypted with no explanation as to when where and how um, one of the things that we found was that it meant if you took a literal um, uh, um, uh, interpretation of it is that from the moment that data is created it must be encrypted. That data includes um, headers from email, um, parts of the logs from your web servers, it also includes names and addresses um, of your clients. Well of course if you're running MyOB and your data is encrypted then you can't use it. So you'll need to decrypt it for a little while while you use it. And the Attorney General's response to us was, oh, well, that's okay, we didn't really mean that. Um, well, that's fine, but that's what it says in the legislation. So what happens if a judge who is perhaps a little bit unsympathetic to our cause says, well, that's the literal meaning of the act and you're in breach of it. And they said, well, I don't think you need to worry about that. So what a lot of us as ISPs did, and Michael Cordoba, who spoke last year, is here, um, uh, is apply, and Michael, we did, we applied for an exemption uh, from uh, the requirement to encrypt under the Act when the data was active. And many of us did that and many of us got it. Um, that doesn't mean that the legislation is right, it just means that we've protected ourselves from what is effectively something that was very, very wrong. So trusted integrity goes to the fundamental basis of what we do as technocrats. We need to ensure that people can trust what we do and that what comes out of it is integral and it is reliable. And for the Internet, for an Internet Australia and for Internet Society, that is fundamental to, the, to, to, the, to everything that we do. The attacks on data, um, whether it's been from governments or whether it's from uh, criminals or whether it's from anybody else uh, at a political, social or uh, economic level, um, the protection of integrity is now regarded as a fundamental tenet of what the Internet Society needs to do. And we work with the Internet Architecture Board and um, uh, Internet Society and Internet uh, Engineering Task Force to ensure that we move towards that. But when you go out into the street and say to people, you need to encrypt, you know, it's very dangerous out there, what they think is our credit card numbers are going to get stolen. Well, yes, that's part of it. Um, you know, we've heard about this thing called identity theft. What's that? Oh, well, you know, that's also a part of it. Uh, but can we talk about the bigger picture? Um, and you very often get very glazed eyes, and so the people look at us and say, well, no, you know, we're not interested in doing that sort of thing. And yet we're the ones that have to guard that process. 
Um, and very often it requires a large amount of, uh, uh, of technical expertise to ensure that your systems are integral. Anybody who's run a web server knows that it's risk mitigation. It's not the fact that you will defend them um, to 100%. It is a matter of mitigating the risks uh, in terms of the latest current code that you have. And when another exploit is found and little script kiddies get in, you take the next step to ensure that you've automatically patched it and you have scanners that pick it up and quarantine whatever it is, hoping that it's not part of the uh, original file set. And that is a constant battle. Um, I remember going to a board meeting uh, with, uh, with board members and advising them that the risk mitigation strategy needs to be taken more seriously. And they said, risk mitigation? What are you talking about? Why don't we just eliminate the risks altogether? And I said, yes, there is a way of doing that. And they said, how? I said, cut everything off from the internet. Um, wasn't well received. Um, and then people scurried to check the company's insurance straight afterwards because they had not understood the levels of management of that risk at that level. And you'll find that the Australian Institute of Company Directors is now looking at a thing called cybersecurity as a part of a director's role in terms of governance. Um, so how does that impact on the open source community? Well, I'm going to get a little bit mercenary here. Um, I've just listened to a talk by VM Brasser next door. Um, interesting, um, talking about how the business of community and how uh, the business uh, uh, ca case can be made for a community within a commercial organisation. Well, I'm going to go broader than that because part of the defence of the internet is ensuring that we engage with our stakeholders. And Internet Australia has found it difficult to get there at a technical level. And there are things that we'd like to share with you in terms of the open source community as well. So are we helping or not? Um, open source systems, most of them Linux-based, run most of the net. We know this. Uh, the engine under most layers of security is open source-based. And the biggest thing in terms of the threat, the hope uh, of what we can do, but the threat to security is, of course, IoT. Most devices on this planet run variants of Linux. BusyBox is going to be the most prevalent um, subsystem uh, on the planet if it isn't already. And these include trains, planes, and automobiles. You know, so we're talking about the wonders of uh, autonomous cars, driverless cars. Um, I sat in a Tesla uh, of a friend who then put it in into autopilot, and I watched it change lanes all by itself. It was both thrilling and terrifying. The majority of proprietary CPA and hardware applications are also powered by a variant of Linux. What relationship does the open source community have to those commercial organizations in America, in Taiwan, in China, and other places where this hardware is manufactured? And I had the, uh, um, the privilege of being at um, the Internet Governance Forum in Turkey two years ago, um, where the Taiwanese manufacturers sat on a panel with Vint Cerf and said to the community that we have concerns about the fact that we are not being listened to as hardware manufacturers by the people who are, who are um, employing us to make this CPE uh, and who are cutting the code. Um, and there was quite clearly a, a disconnect between the people commissioning the work and the people doing it. The warning was quite simple. Please, 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 you have not thought some of these things through. How are you going to push updates? And we know all about this. How are you going to push updates to half a million small devices? It's not just the OS, it's the app and program layer too. And systems and apps that are not based on FOSS often depend on FOSS externally. If you look at most of the routers, most of the uh, uh, switches, and most of the things that move packets across the internet, you'll find that fundamentally um, many of those uh, resources are based on open source. And it wouldn't be a Linux conference if we didn't uh, uh, quote Stephen Vaughan Lickles. I don't know if anybody else had this, this time around, but uh, as he said there, there was a great article that he put out um, earlier this year. Linux and open source software now run the world, and that means we need to work harder than ever to make sure it's trustworthy. This trust word keeps coming up over and over and over again. Outside of us, outside of the people who understand intimately what our communities are all about, what is it that people think? And if we have a look at um, uh, the issues of uh, um, uh, 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 the, the, the perceptions of good and, and whether or not we're helping, 
Um, we need to look at things like code and it, that is open to security. One of the things that we promote about open source is that it is open. You can check the code. We've just had a, a talk I didn't go to. I don't know if anybody went to the talk on re reproducible uh, uh, code, uh, re reproducible programs and things like that. Well, Debian's move towards reproducible builds is a step in that direction. The integrity of code doesn't make it safer, but it, make it makes it open to, secure, to, to scrutiny. Um, and as was said by uh, Eric Raymond, uh, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, provided you're looking. And that is the case. There are many very good cases, day in, day out, where bugs are found, and we all know about them, we hear them, they're on the lists, we get to them, patches are put out, and they're sorted out. AKA, there's a community-wide, rapid, and public exposure of problems and delivery of solutions. The argument against closed so um, software uh, environments are that they, you have finite resources um, and you are limited to what you know and you find out because if you are dealing with binaries, the only thing we can do is report the symptoms, not the cause. Now, I don't know that that's particularly true. I think anybody um, who uses a Windows environment will be aware of the fact that it is significantly safer than it was five years ago. And, uh, um, um, I don't think there's any question of the fact that Microsoft saw merit in saying that we are secure, safe, stable and trusted. Regardless of whether it's open source or not, that is a message that we need to give to the community and I don't think that there is any discourse that suggests otherwise. And of course, in the world of open source, that wide peer review, people checking on other people and saying, well, yes, I agree, but I've tested it, but I think you've got this other bug. Um, is a common occurrence. Some recent very good examples, and there are many of them, but I think these are the highlights. The, the question of dirty cow. Um, it was an example of the, where there was a serious kernel flaw. They claim, every time we get a, a, um, a Linux flaw or a kernel flaw, it's the worst um, flaw ever. Have you ever noticed that? It's always the worst flaw ever. Um, a good example uh, was uh, um, the Linux kernel flaw, the dirty cow Linux um, kernel flaw. Um, and many of us were aware of what happened, and when the flaw was found and discovered and, and, and the, uh, um, the understanding of what the flaw was, um, there was wildfire uh, dissemination of the information, and the, uh, the message was that the fix was, was put out within hours. That's a really good thing, but on the other side of things, we also have to have those people who are in the sysadmin roles updating. Um, and there are some sysadmins that are constantly doing that and there are others saying don't touch it unless it's broken. And the fact that it's got a flaw in it like that doesn't mean that it's broken, it just means that it's vulnerable. Um, semantics, it depends on how you look at it. So while this is a good example, the fact is that the follow-up must be there as well. So an integral process in terms of trust is a matter of saying, yes, we have a fix, and yes, that was very good, wasn't it? But somebody has to follow up and fix it. And of course, if you are not running up-to-date um, uh, 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 versions of your, your, your operating system, that's another issue. You know? And again, the usual argument is, oh, well, it isn't backwardly compatible with a few things that we're running, you know, those sorts of things. So, yes. We can say to the public that open source software has many advantages in terms of the ability to fix it. We might be able to fix it, but the implementation of those fixes is also something that's very important. And there's a great article in Reddit, um, um, and you'll find the thread in Reddit about what's good and what's bad about open source. Open source is no better than, than closed source, uh, except that it is more open to being fixed. You still have to fix it. I thought this was an interesting example. I'm not sure how it fits in here, but uh, apparently the US of, of Department of Homeland Security has an open source hardening project. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, it was established in 2006. As it says, the, the, the scheme looked at 50 million lines of code and found that 250 open source projects, uh, there was one software flaw in every thousand lines of code. And as a result, uh, it has enabled the open source community to fix 7,826 flaws which benefited all users. Well, thank God for the Department of Homeland Security. Um, could they have a chat with the NSA about uh, the other parts of integrity of the net? So are we helping or not? I'm going to be a little bit insulting here, and the, uh, 
the, the top. I don't notice that there is a back door here, so I, I will be able to escape. Um, is the open source and internet community still gave it getting over what we call seatbelt syndrome? Now, for those of you old enough, I notice that there are a few people right here. here. Um, you'll remember that seatbelts weren't universally accepted in cars. You know, there was a fear that you'd be trapped in the car if it caught on fire. Uh, there was a fear of claustrophobia, would crease your, your clothes and those sorts of things. And yet, when you look at cars today, it's inconceivable that you would get in a car without putting a seatbelt on. In fact, you feel very unsafe if you don't. And in the early days of the internet community, as I indicated last year, um, there was a very huge paradox in the sense that ARPANET was part of the motivation, the RAND Corporation was part of the motivation of developing the internet, and yet, uh, unwittingly, they handed it to a bunch of hipsters and hippies um, that happened to be academics in those days, in the 60s and 70s, um, who then said, this is really cool. They made computers talk to each other. They used that to talk to each other. There were no firewalls, and again, as I said before, spam was a Monty Python song, those sorts of things. And very often, um, we still find code uh, around in programs that are running that were built on that same premise. You know, nothing's going to go wrong. The other aspect is shifting the onus of responsibility and security to the other person. Oh, well, it doesn't matter about the code, you just need to keep the bad guys out. So make sure that your firewalls run well and that you stop any unauthorized access. That's fine in the days when you had what's known as the Bastion Firewall and NAT and things like that, where you had a firewall around the corporation and nothing inside it was affected by the outside world until somebody with a 4G smartphone went in and plugged it into the USB port and connected it up to the data port on your um, PC and then infected it. All of a sudden, that doesn't work too well. And all of a sudden, we are looking at the question of protecting devices. So we're moving that firewall back from the device, uh, from the, the bastion into the devices. And in the devices, of course, there are apps and programs and subsystems and things like that. So while we at the International Australia are taking um, the brunt of saying, well, we need to harden up on the front lines of how these devices communicate with things, and why we need to look at things like this latest flaw in, in IPv6, the fragmentation problem, which some of you may have looked at. Um, we also need to accept the fact that firewalls are not necessarily the be-all and end-all of defense. We need to protect the devices, and then we need to go back further into the devices and protect the subsystems to ensure they don't attack each other. It's a bit like dealing with cancer, really, isn't it? Security, until recently, is something we all did afterwards, maybe. Next week, we will eat healthier, drink less, and stop smoking. That was my New Year's resolution. Well, I don't smoke, so I'm okay on that. The perceptions are bad. If code is exposed, how can it be safe from bad people? Especially from a corporate's perspective, who is accountable and who do you go to when things go wrong? It's easy for us to say that the community is there, and... For those of us who work within the community, it's never a problem to find where we need to go to to fix something up. Our company constantly goes to small businesses like accountants, lawyers, uh, medical specialists, those kinds of people. And we constantly talk about the fact that we can provide them with a completely open source uh, environment. The first question is what's open source? The second question is, why is it free? Shouldn't we be paying something? And the third question is, we've never heard of it, so how can it be any good? And when you explain that 80% of the internet is run by Linux and by open source, um, instead of reassuring them, it sort of disturbs them a little bit because they haven't been exposed to it. And there is something that I will talk about in a minute um, that is quite simply the reason why they haven't. Who sets the standards and who oversees the review and the rigor? Well, um, I don't know if there's any more rigorous uh, policing of a piece of code than the kernel, uh, the Linux kernel, um, and that has gone on for a long time. I remember uh, in 1996 being at a conference, an international conference, where John Postel, who was the godfather of DNS, was there. Um, and in typical form, one of my heroes, I managed to meet him around a water cooler. 
um, and I talked to him. And in the plenary, um, I said to him, or I said to the community, what happens if John Postel dies? Because DNS sat on his desk at the U University of Southern California. And for those of you who know the history of the DNS, that's where all the problems started. And that's when organizations like the US government said, this is dangerous because if John turns that off, we're in deep shit. Well, that sort of thing does go on, but at the same time, we've also asked the question, I mean, it's an interesting and provocative question, what happens if something happens to Linus Torvalds? Now, I think we're pretty much assured of the fact that there are enough out, uh, Linus Torvalds protégés out there to keep that kernel going, but which of them will be the supremo? You know, which of them will take care of the stability of that kernel in an unreasonable dictatorship-type fashion where nobody questions the fact that nobody will get past Linus in order to do that? That's a really hard question to answer. Um, but it is something to do with that trust, integrity, and reliability of what we do. I heard from next door that we're a community of volunteers and that you can create a community within an organization, but you have to put up a marketing plan, you have to put up an implementation plan, you have to be able to cost it out and make it worthwhile in terms of the company investing in that open source project within your community. That takes work. Um, but nevertheless, the internet works. The internet is run through the IAB and the IETF. And of course, in that situation, nobody gets paid on the IETF or the IAB, oh, except the administrators. Nobody has a law or a treaty that says this is how the internet will be built, and yet it works. And similarly, within the open source community, in terms of defending the net, most of those open source standards are drilled into what we do on a daily, big, on a daily basis. So the perception of a community of volunteers and somehow an amateur group of people doing stuff as hobbies um, doesn't ring, quite ring true. There's no financial certainty or stability. Well, I'll address that because the answer is both yes and no. You know, um, how many of us feel that we should be far better remunerated for what we do in the open source community? Not because we like money, well, we might like money, but more like you know, the amount of time I put in, it would be so much better if somebody supported me while I did it. How many pe people feel like they sneak away from their employers to do this sort of things rather than be supported by them? Um, I think, <laughs> You employ yourself. <laughs> you have a major problem. <laughs> and the issue of chaotic and lacking in leadership. You know, who, who runs this thing? I mean, from normal business circumstances, we do not understand. And, and that's part of the problem. Uh, and that's a very difficult uh, question to answer. How much time have we got? Right, thanks. Um, it is interesting that, that, that open source programs that fail in leadership are very often use this term that nobody understands called a fork. And so when you say there's a lack of leadership, um, there is usually something bubbling up in the, uh, in the background. And some of you may be old enough to remember a project in Australia called Mambo, which was a content management system. And that became Joomla. And of course, OpenOffice is now um, somewhat in the doldrums, but we have LibreOffice, et cetera, et cetera. Highly disciplined forks of, of these projects that lost their way. So leadership um, is an interesting concept within open source. Myths, yes, probably. But let's not be too uh, um, uh, complacent about that. Because there is one very famous one that's been talked about that is an example of the low point of what happens when you don't fund a fundamental project uh, uh, at the beginning. And that was called Heartbleed. We all knew about Heartbleed as soon as it came out. We all reacted to it. What we were shocked about is the fact that the open source community had not picked up the fact that there was a vulnerability for two years. And when you read about the stats, you'll understand why. Um, as it says there, the open, source, open SSL project existed on a budget of $2,000 per year in donations, which was enough to cover the electrical bill. And Steve Henson was earning around $20,000 per year, not exactly uh, um, you know, a, a, a handsome amount of money. And the interesting thing about all of that is that while that is the case, who was using SSL? Who was depending on SSL? Just about every organization on the planet, including VeriSign, including Rapid SSL, all of the other organizations, 
depended, well, they were dependent on the fact that $2,000 a year were, was made to allow Steve Henson to, to uh, uh, maintain. Now, that's not the complete story. Steve Henson was not the only person involved with the whole thing. But uh, I think it makes the point that this is really a situation where it slipped through the cracks. Enough eyeballs on a particular thing and the bug becomes shallow. Well, clearly there weren't enough eyeballs on this one. Now, for the open source community, that's not the end of the story because what happened after Heartbleed was heartening in the sense that people realized that they got this wrong. The people who were depending on this type of thing got it wrong and what was formed after that by an organization uh, uh, over this one, the Linux uh, Foundation, there was a thing called the Core Infrastructure Initi Initiative that was set up. And Jim Zemlin, who's still, I believe, the executive director of uh, the Linux Foundation, um, started this and got a large number of organizations to donate $100,000 a year for the next three years, bringing the initial funding pool to almost $4 million. Now, still not a lot in the terms of global software development, but the reaction was instantaneous. This could bring down the entire net. It certainly threatened everything that we know about in terms of security and integrity. And so what happened was that uh, 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 a forceful open source organization uh, effectively created a fund to make sure that this occurs. Is there a problem and does it need fixing? There is no issue in terms of the technical relevance and excellence of what the open source community does. And there is no denying that open source software arguably runs the world. And the open source world moves as fast as the availability of experts in it. And there are a lot. But resourcing, including dollars, helps. The perception that we are a bunch of well-meaning volunteers, amateurs who enjoy a hobby, um, that do things for fun, uh, may be true to a point. I'm not sure about the amateur bit anymore. But what we do know is that substantially large open source projects are well-funded and are driven like businesses. In fact, our businesses. I don't know if there's anybody from Red Hat here, is there? Um, Red Hat is probably one of the examples where the open source community has benefited from a commercial approach. And the derivative of that, Fedora, CentOS, you know, those sorts of things drive a lot of what happens on the net. Without that, um, it really is hard to see how many of us can be supported. Um, Miss Brasser next door was talking about how to build open source communities. She works for HP Enterprise. You know, um, Vitz Venema, who developed Postfix, worked for, po for IBM. And we all know that Linus Torvalds has been strongly supported in terms of uh, maintaining a living in the United States. My company, um, small that it is, uh, has the firm belief that unless we support open code, then there are a large number of very bad consequences for us if we don't. And we, as a small part of that community, will continue to do so. But in Internet Australia, we've realised one thing, in Australia at least, and that is that we are heavily engaged at OSI Layer 8. We believe that it's not possible to ignore political and social impacts and our persuasion on technical roles. And engagement with business and users is vital in maintaining our relevance to a broader spectrum of stakeholders. This is different in 2017. For many years, we've had a situation where we develop the code, companies develop the products, they sell them, and the community doesn't care. So long as it works, they don't care. There is a community of people growing up now uh, my sons, who are now decision makers in the market, who understand more of the concepts of these things, and they are demanding more answerability in terms of how these things are put together. IoT is proliferating, huge social impacts. The digital economy is now actually a thing. Even politicians now talk about the digital economy. I'm not sure they understand it, but they're certainly talking about it. Everything is connected to the net, and those things that connect or interact with the net are often built on components of FOSS. And engagement with the wider user community is usually vicarious. A less direct understanding about the impact of FOSS on the community is there from the community itself. How many people are directly engaged in stakeholder meetings explaining the technology in FOSS? Very few. 
Not, not no one, but very few. In the internet world, we have been forced upon it because everybody says the internet's dangerous now and you're responsible for it. So if a firewall breaks and somebody gets hacked or if somebody gets, uh, uh, man manages to get a whole bunch of passwords and usernames, you know, politicians using Yahoo, for instance, um, uh, the other point is that we have an open source standard for encryption, don't we, for mail? Um, pretty we don't use it. Um, that sort of thing needs to go on at a much higher level. Why? Because if the stakeholders are educated and informed, there's a better chance that we can work out where the problems are and they can defend themselves. A system is made up of several things, hardware, software and humans. And if we don't educate the humans, then part of that system is probably broken. So how come we struggle for wider support and recognition by the broader public? Well, that's actually a pretty blunt answer, and please forgive me if this offends. Proprietary software sells. How many times have you walked into Officeworks and seen a whole bunch of Microsoft stuff, not criticizing them? Um, but in, in, in that sense, how many times have you walked into a place like that and said, oh, look, there's some open source on the shelf. You know, where do you get it from? The general public and business often have direct relationships with proprietary software companies, but the path, as I've said before, between FOSS community and ultimate stakeholders is much less direct. I can't even spell internet properly. Um, <laughs> the internet matters to the whole population. That's why we were forced out into the forefront. And this last 18 months is about changing the attitude of our organisation from a well-meaning technical community that was listened to with great respect but ignored to an organisation with bite that says, look, the sky is falling and you, you need to listen to us, especially the politicians. Engagement and communication with social and political levels, again, OSI level eight, um, provides us with opportunities to educate, protect, inform and enable. We are subsidised in our roles by our employers because they recognise that it's important and security, trust and integrity are best implemented with collaboration with the cohort that you are trying to assist and respect. And as with the, uh, um, um, the, the CII, some of the big providers support us financially. Google and others are members of our organisation. It's not that they influence us, they believe it's important. They disagree with us a lot, but they're glad we're out there arguing. Has anybody seen this before? It's on the Linux Foundation's website. And one of the most important things that the Linux Foundation is doing right now is saying engage, engage, engage. We need to make sure that organizations and companies understand that what we do is relevant to them. It isn't necessary that they support us, but they need to understand that it's relevant to them and they can take control over projects if they want to. This is not anti-Microsoft, it's pro-open source. And the two things are very different. I'm running out of time, so I will say one more thing about uh, um, uh, security, integrity and trust. The Internet, Internet Australia runs a security special interest group. It's made up of the Internet Commerce Security Lab. It's made up of NX Test Labs, which is a commercial organisation. Um, it's made up of people who are interested in how we secure the Internet and how we get practical solutions to feed out to businesses to help themselves. We're not trying to be esoteric about things. What we're doing is going out to those organisations such as the business groups, the AI group, um, employment associations and those sorts of things saying, please, you need to listen to us. You don't encrypt your mail, so you're, you're busy sending a letter paperclip to the outside of the envelope in an open system that everybody can read. And you're lawyers. Why are you doing this? Um, we are trying to educate at that level. We would like to say to the open source community and to, uh, Internet, uh, to, to uh, Linux Australia, we would like to become involved on a joint basis with developing those resources, raising profiles, looking at the people who are our stakeholders and saying, you need to support us, whether it's financially or otherwise, you need to come out with us and say, security is a big thing. This year especially, uh, like no other year before. And I believe that it is possible to, to provide some exchanges between the organisations to raise those sorts of things as awareness. It is a matter of going out and saying very simple things to simple people, things that we understand and take for granted and don't think are very difficult. 
but simply making sure that you've changed the password on a router and made sure that the firmware is up to date, people need to understand how that happens. We have the ability to do that to the wider public. And it is possible for the wider public to appreciate at a more high profile level what we do in terms of security, integrity and trust of what they do on an everyday basis in the digital economy. If we do not do that, do not expect the governments to prescribe some way in which it will happen because it won't. We have worked with federal and state governments. We probably have more success with state governments than federal. Uh, but at this point in time, we happen to be the voices of those users on the internet to say things are broken and you're not helping. If we don't have that across the industry and across the communities, then we have a lumpy development of what will be a safe and secure digital environment. And I think it's up to us to try and do something about it. And uh, um, I certainly will be talking to the board of Linux Australia about uh, bringing those two things closer together to ensure that we are more integral in the way that we provide that trust and integrity and reliability. On that point, I think I better stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. We have time for one or two questions, if there are any. Yes, we have one. Good God, it's the last session and somebody's got a question. Um, you were at the keynote this morning. Um, some of the thoughts that yeah. uh, you just presented seem very different to yep. uh, what Rob was thinking. Yeah. What, what was your take from this morning? Uh, how do you? I wasn't there, um, oh. um, so I don't know. And it's probably a good Ignore thing. Ignore my question then. <laughs> No, but please uh, put out the, uh, the issues. <laughs> no, no, never mind. I don't think we've got time for that. Uh, does anyone else have a question? In that case, thank you very much, George. Cheers. <laughs>